everyone. Uh, it's great to have you here today. Uh, my name is Evo Haining. I think I can reduce this microphone. If you're still hearing me, can you let me know? Yes, yeah, we can hear great. you. Great, all right, let's get rid of that mic. I think I'm using the desktop one today. Uh, it's great to see you here. Thank you for joining us for Metatraversal 3. This is the third part in a series of conversations uh, moving toward a deliberative process around how we move across worlds. And uh, so many of you have been a part of these amazing conversations in various aspects, whether it's as an organizer, as someone who can help connect the dots, as someone who supports R&D, as someone who holds a platform or holds a piece of the infrastructure necessary to make these traversals work. Uh, so just to give us a, a little bit of background, we started this in October. Uh, if you haven't watched the previous two videos, please go back and uh, check those out. There's also short summaries that might help. So uh, we're going to be diving in today to look at a number of specific use cases where uh, Meta Traversal has been tested in, in a couple of different platforms. We're going to be hearing from a number of speakers uh, from across the spectrum, some who are creators, producers, some who are uh, CEOs, platform holders, uh, and those of us who have been supporting the open R&D necessary for this work to thrive um, across ecosystems and across verticals. So uh, we're going to be uh, diving into a, a couple of sort of real world use cases, including uh, one today that will be live, but uh, we want to encourage you to keep the uh, conversation active with each other, and that's in DMs and that's chat here as well. Um, while this is a recorded session, uh, so feel free to grab a screenshot or something if you want, uh, and feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. If you haven't been here before and you wanna be able to say hi to each other or let each other know where you are and where you're coming from so that we can help uh, collaborate and grow and, and do this work together in a more effective way. So, um, just to step back one more time, I am also uh, sitting here as two chairs. I help co-host here with Neil, Terry, Ben, Julie, and a slew of amazing people that Ben has assembled. And thank you, Ben, for organizing and making this happen. Um, uh, Daniel, oh goodness, I almost missed you, Daniel. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, you have all been fantastic and thank you for helping to bring these conversations together. Um, we're gonna put up our agenda onto the schedule uh, so you can see it just a bit, but uh, just to give you a, a little bit of a prefacing background, we are going to have a number of five minute conversations today, uh, including one or two uh, sort of walking through use cases. And then we're going to have a little bit of time at the end for discussion and next steps. And so we want to encourage you to uh, keep the conversation lively, but also if you're holding on to specific questions that you think need to be unwrapped with the rest of this community, we're going to save some time uh, toward the end uh, after about 9, 10 this morning. I'm sorry, after about 10, 10 PST this morning. So agenda for today, our first speaker will be up next. And uh, Ben, if you could stick our agenda up so we could just see that for a second and a little bit of a uh, background. We have a number of amazing speakers here today. Uh, Julie is going to be kicking us off and has been doing a fantastic job of recording, but also bringing together our thoughts in Miro boards and helping to connect the dots. So uh, Julie Smithson, uh, Gabriel is going to be speaking about uh, the work at Spatial Web Foundation versus an IEEE. Uh, Joanna Popper, um, really excited to see you here today, Joanna. It's great to see you. Uh, Austin, uh, also known as Austin AI, uh, will be sharing his work. David, um, very excited to see you here as well. Arnold at VR Land. And then I believe we have a second uh, round of folks who will be coming in. We have a recorded talk from Amy. We have Joyce Betancourt, who also leads Avacon here with us today, and uh, Christopher Lafayette and Archer uh, from Somnium Space. So this is gonna be a really rich conversation from a wide variety of perspectives, and we hope that you'll be able to uh, stick around and share the recording with friends. So with that said, I'm gonna invite Julie up, and uh, thank you for making time for being with us today. And Julie is such an amazing synthesizer for our community. And so I just wanna thank you, Julie, for making things happen, but also for taking the, the time and the care 
to really steward that conversation and how we weave it together. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, you know, I am proud to be able to contribute to this community. And one of the things that I did last time we met is, um, and I'm sure you've heard of uh, Miro. I used a Miro board to kind of visualize and and put down uh, the thoughts of the entire community. And and through that, I started to find obviously repetition of what we were talking about. And that's what I wanna show with, sh share with you here today because when we finished the uh, last session, um, you know, we were, you know, okay, so what's next? <laughs> what's next? We can keep talking and having presentations, but what's next? And, and I thought it was really important um, uh, to kind of drive into these factors here that I'm gonna highlight and zoom in, but I just wanted to um, highlight a few pieces that I, I pulled from here, you know, meta traversal is working towards a, a joint declaration and cooperation from immersive platforms and standards of interoperability. That's why we're all here, okay? And we have, you know, contributions from Kronos um, and so many other, uh, you know, enterprise companies that are contributing towards understanding that we need to come together. We need to have this open source of information so that we can all be aligned on you know, how we're going to be interoperable <laughs> within these worlds. So, um, you know, I even pulled out a piece from Terry Schusler's presentation, you know, on, you know, how the metaverse consists of, you know, different layers. Um, I even pulled, um, you know, a piece from Gabriel Rene, which you'll hear, hear from him next, and a piece that just is helping me understand the web, you know, web 3.0 stack and how it's going to work. Um, I think that we need to have a conversation about accessibility. Um, that's another huge piece of, you know, what we need to talk about. So um, just, uh, and this was Alvin Braylon, you know, talking about where the internet took us and, you know, where we're moving into that metaverse. And yes, I say, I say metaverse, but I can even think that term sometime is overkill. Um, so let's jump back to meta traversal and talk about how are we going to make this interoperable? And the green, uh, the green squares here was what was repetitious of last time. We talked about UX and UI design. We talked about ethics. We talked about avatars, portals, and the marketplace. And those seem to be the, you know, the points that we really need to drive these conversations towards to put these standards, the best practices, and, and things into place. And, um, you know, uh, it's interesting, and I know Daniel uh, Dybosky Bryant's on the call. It's been two years since I uh, did that presentation on humanics um, back in Educators VR, and that term is coming back because it's such a an important part of our mental agency and, and how we deal with technology today. And I think, you know, um, uh, I think it was Nicole Le, uh, Lazaro. She did the presentation uh, on mental agency the last time, and. You know, everybody knows that if we don't have that health and well-being, uh, first and foremost, moving into becoming an avatar in a, you know, a world where, you know, we're crossing over into different platforms and we want to take assets. And, you know, once we start to exchange NFTs in these worlds, how do they port over? So there's so many conversations, but um, I just wanted to let you know behind the scenes, I'm going to work on this board. If anybody wants to help me, just message me in the chat and I'll, I'll give you private permission on to um, contributing. But I'm going to be taking some of these conversations today and adding more to this um, and moving forward, working with these green stickers of like, let's start focusing on those things and seeing how we can all come together and collaborate. So thanks this so much, wonderful. everybody, for joining us today. and. Um, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing and learning from everybody else as well. I'll be working behind the scenes and it's great to see everybody. Thank you. Julie, you are phenomenal. Thank you so much for the hard work you've put into this. And also, if you see topics there that we are not necessarily exploring today, yeah, uh, we are going to have another of these conversations. Our goal is for the first week of March. And these are uh, more deliberative conversations, conversations that need to happen with each other in the room together in some cases. And so figuring out how we create more space for that sort of collaborative effort to happen uh, as we move forward. Julie, you've done phenomenal work and thank you for helping us uh, contextualize all of the issues at stake here. Uh, we are going to be bringing on Gabriel and I hope that uh, you're excited as well. Uh, we're excited for having you here. Um, let's see if we've got him pinned. 
Excellent. It's great to have you here. Oh, we've got you muted. Let's see. One second. How about now? Perfect. Perfect. Great. All right. I, I'm going to let you roll with it for a few minutes, and then I'd love to come back and ask you a question or two so that we can uh, sure. dovetail and contextualize. Okay. I will. Uh, I'm going to do my best to go as fast as possible to fit a whole lot into five minutes. So I apologize if this is a bit of a fire hose, but um, many of you know me and some of you we haven't had a chance to meet. So I'm very um, honored to have the opportunity uh, to be invited here to, to present some some of our work to you guys and and look for areas of intersection and collaboration. So, um, like I said, Evo, if, uh, if I'm going too fast or <laughs> if, I, if I need to wrap it up, feel free to give me signals in any direction. OK. All right, can everybody see my screen now? Excellent. Yeah. Um, my name is Gabriel Rene. Um, I'll give a very brief uh, introduction. Um, I started working in uh, uh, advanced R&D uh, at a group called CyberLab uh, in 1992. Um, I specialize in what's come to be known in as XR, AI, IoT, and I'm, I'm a very horizontal player here and that I'm, I, my background is kind of a, a broadly across many of these technologies, including a, a long stint in the telecom space and the 5G was where, where it really became clear that the machines and the holographic information and sort of autonomous vehicles were gonna be the new uh, customers of, of telecom. So I got out of telecom uh, in 2016, grabbed Dan Mapes, um, and uh, you know, former founder of CyberLab, and we started more or less the Versus project, and that's that's formed into two entities: the Spatial Web Foundation, which has developed the standards around that, the Spatial Web, uh, partner with IEEE now, and Versus Labs, which is essentially sort of the red hat to the Linux of the foundation, and is building commercial applications uh, with with governments and Fortune 500 com companies around the world that are really looking uh, for how do, how do they get involved? How do they get in the game? And how does this stuff work? And how will it apply to regulations and all kinds of you know other scalable existential planetary challenges? So that's the purpose of the Spatial Web Foundation Foundation really to develop these standards, promote these standards, work with the global community around that. So um, can you guys see the top of the, the text here? Or is it blocking like on my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. So there's a, I'd like to make the distinction now between the term spatial web and metaverse. And as a lot of times you see me parsing these little nuances. Um, someone got in an argument with me recently um, and said, well, this is just semantics masquerading as science. And I wanted to point out that semantics is science. But um, so what we have here is uh, mm -hmm. sort of four different views of the role of exponential technologies, right? So there's kind of this human 2.0 thing, you know, biotech, uh, transhumanism, uh, the intersection of humans and AI and IoT, et cetera, et cetera. The Japanese are talking a lot about the smart society, society 5.0, how those same technologies impact social services and the future of governance and, you know, society as a whole, even our value and sort of moral fabric. Industry 4.0 is all about the sort of cyber physical systems using digital systems, more or less to drive productivity and autonomy at scale. And then there's sort of the web 3.0. We've watched this term evolve over the last 15 years and taking a lot of different forms. It's still kind of the semantic, semantic O spatial E web. Uh, it, more recently, it's become you know, anchored in the sort of metaverse concept. We might think of this as the experience economy. If you, anyone knows about Joe Pine's work. But these are all different lenses really. And so the Space Web Foundation and our work is, is centers around the convergence of these uh, emerging exponential technologies. When we talk about interoperability, we look at this atomic scale. How do hardware and software systems uh, that are dealing with multi-dimensional data sets um, in multiple sort of domains and environments, uh, how, do, how, how are they interoperable? So the first question is how are they coherent? We have to figure out ways of describing reality in multiple dimensions that gets us interoperability, that interoperability gets us governance. The ability to have coherence gets, gets us that, and that entire thing is essentially what context awareness is about. Um, so the convergence of these technologies is, is really our focus. 
there are these several perspectives we just talked about. Anyone that has a background in integral theory might recognize this. So there's an individual and a collective sort of perspective. There's an interior and an exterior, and you have four different quadrants. So imagine those four quadrants, each being a unique perspective, looking at the same technologies, the sort of bucket of technologies here. So human 2.0, it's kind of the individual exterior, it's looking in, you know, it's looking into these technologies, but really seeing how they apply to the exterior biology and enhancements. So whether we're talking genomics, we're talking transhumanism, the role of AI in the mind, that's human 2.0. Web 3.0, it's about the interior sort of experience of, of information content and et cetera, right? And it's very much like the sort of the digital twin where the virtual reality, we run simulations in our mind, now it's presented into the environment around us. Industry 4.0 about autonomous systems. Again, looking at that same sort of bucket of technologies, uh, you know, in, in through its own lens, through its own uh, set of goals, and then to smart uh, smart society, society 0.0, really about the sort of values and ethics, the interior goals of a society and its ambitions, and how to govern society at that next level. So all of these are super important. When we look at the space web standards, it's about internetworking context amongst the different hardware and software systems in multi, multiple dimensions in such a way that those various lenses, those various, if you wanted to call them verses, um, uh, can, can operate uh, around their goals. But of course we need them to operate together. So the spatial web is really about enabling interoperability of context at such a scale that regardless of which lens we're looking through here, the applicability is relevant to applications in all of these domains. So some of you may have seen this, this graphic before. Um, it's in the spatial web book. I just, yeah, Julie just kind of showed a, a variation that I put on LinkedIn, which got a lot of uh, interesting um, activity. The idea is that there's always a sort of data logic and interface, sort of classic three tier computer science architecture. <clears throat> you need a protocol that's connecting those various uh, layers of the stack. And whether we call it web 3.0 or industry 4.0 or society 5.0, these same technologies in the same stack are what's being applied through those various lenses. And so um, importantly, our position is that document-based protocols or computer address-based protocols are not sufficient for multi-dimensional communications or even declarative sort of descriptions of reality. Um, and so that's why we, we developed hyperspace transaction protocol, which is this sort of uh, uh, both a nod to HTTP and a Star Wars joke uh, built into a very serious um, <laughs> technology protocol. Um, so we see the spatial web uh, as this uh, evolution of networks um, and that those networks each had a key function, the ability to compute, the ability to connect those computers, ability to communicate over connected computers. But the thematic of the spatial web era uh, is really about context awareness. And that's where our focus lies. But today is about hyperporting across the metaverse. So we're going to talk about some of the challenges that we believe are associated with this. Um, first, by just trying to define what we mean by this. What are we teleporting across? It's people. Uh, there are locations. There are digital objects, and there are currencies themselves. These all—all all these need to be portable. And what reality are we even talking about here? Are we talking about only VR? Is that the metaverse, or is it AR? Is it MR? Are these three different objects, or are they the same object with the same ID? in three different locations. And so which reality we've been talking about portability of which asset type is, is really at the heart of this. And this applies to digital twins, digital persons, meaning not just an avatar in VR, but the digital twin of your biological information that you might, your, your health data, which may be related to the, which doctors have access to that information. And obviously the entire industry 4.0 sort of space and the role of digital twins. So just talking about moving avatars through virtual worlds is one thing, but if we don't have standards for all of these things, they won't work together, right? So we need to cover the metaverse and industry 4.0. We need the traceability of the digital thread of that or the provenance of these objects and users. And we need to think about this in way more dimensions than we're even talking about today, which isn't just three, but at least eight. Um, so all the verses have to be considered in this equation, uh, or we will have solved a problem in a corner of the metaverse, multiverse, all the verses, or a corner of the spatial web. And we're, we're approaching this through basically developing a new set of standards uh, to do that. And that's essentially the work that we're doing at the, um, the Spatial Web Foundation. We have completed the first phase of this. We do have what we would propose as solutions for every single one of the problems that have been presented in these kinds of forums. 
it's in a document that's uh, 140 pages that's 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 accessible to members uh, now. And so as opposed to trying to define the problem space, we spent the last years last five years developing that problem space, but also developing what we believe are the solutions to nearly all of the problems related to to many of the challenges for, for, with respect to portability. Hey, we're on uh, right. countdown now. That's and, it. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to stay on time because we're going to lose Joanna at the top of the hour. All right. Have, uh, so, so we're, awesome. we're going to let him finish. Let awesome. him finish. Don't put him <laughs> off for me. I can always come you, back another time. Gabriel, don't, don't stop for me. It was great what you're doing. Keep going. Finish your presentation. All right. Thank you, Jonna. Sorry, I over, uh, over, over uh, <laughs> ruled the moderators, but I think it's I, no, I, want to, I want to respect the rules, but I appreciate the, the opportunity. So there's a new set of protocols, new set of standards that we're proposing. Location-based domains, not document-based domains. These apply to geolocations and all categories of logic. This makes the, the spatial web searchable across these various different domains we talked about which is absolutely critical or the whole thing really won't work. The HSTP query language is a multi-dimensional query language, can query in any number of dimensions. And the HSML modeling language, which more or less lets you describe declaratively any aspect of reality that the human mind can cognize, which by the way, English does fairly well, but we're able to do this programmatically in such a way that computers and AIs can understand it. It's built into a, uh, an ontology that maintains context regardless of the sort of your Mad Libs approach to defining all the aspects and activities and users in your world or verse or domain in any, any number of realities and dimensions. Mm -hmm. And it's hyperspatial DNS, which will be able to resolve between semantic and spatial locations across those spatial domains. And then you can create policies all around this. The next step and the ultimate sort of um, thing here is that there is a going to be a spatial web browser, that spatial web browser which we're working on now. We'll have a demo, demo by the end of the year. Uh, We'll essentially be create the next browser wars around this but this, every single layer and channel that may need to be relevant or displayed will essentially be in this sort of uh, this is this is browser. a great place to stop and I want to just go ahead and and open great. it up here because addressability and all the work you're dealing with at Spatial Web Foundation is absolutely very valuable. Uh, Aaron and others here have been in the chat just thanking you for, for all that you're bringing. Uh, your book, Spatial Web, is a great place to start with this, but if you want to get into Spatial Web Foundation and the work you're doing with IEEE specifically, uh, reach out to you. Is that the best way to do it? Yeah, absolutely. Great. And I'm, I'm, on, I'm on all the I'm on all the socials. And totally <laughs> Thank you so much for, <laughs> for bringing such rich info today. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, Gabriel. Sorry to have uh, rushed you along there. That was awesome. And uh, no need. So much I'm a guest. It was incredible. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Evo. Thank you, Joanna. Joanna, uh, could you turn your video on so I could add to the spotlight for you? Yeah. And Joanna, thank you for uh, yielding. I appreciate that so much. It's great to have you here as well. And we want to make sure that we bring all of these perspectives together in a way that allows them to dance on the dance floor here. So Joanna, thank you. Here, my video is just loading still, it says. There you are. Hey, I see you buddy. now. I am on oh, my lighting is not good. Um, great to see everybody. Thanks for the invite to come and, and chat. Um, you know, I was I was invited just to pop in and chat. I don't have a big uh, big presentation, um, but I can share just like one or one or two slides. For those who don't know me, I'm Joanna Popper. I'm at HP. I lead our go to market initiatives for XR. Um, but I actually I know a lot of people on the call, and I've worked with a lot of people on the call. So great to see everyone. Still, still socially distanced. Um, so, so really excited that that you all are putting together these conversations and the, you know this this um, all of all of this you know all of this background. Let me just pull up what I want to share. Okay, so you know, some of what I'll share is is well, I'll say is you know what we're what we're doing at HP. You know, some of it, some of it, you know, we're ready. We're ready to share a lot of it. We're still, we're still, um, isn't yet in a, in a place that we're we're sharing publicly. So, but I'll so I'll share kind of from the point of view of some of our some of what we're up to, as well as um, some of my own personal points of view. Oh, my computer's not responding. Okay, is it? It's, hold on a second. Are, what are, are you guys seeing anything? 
Not yet. Yeah. All right. It's just it's frozen for a sec. All right. Am I frozen or just my just the sharing? You're fine. It's just the sharing's not coming. Through. Yeah, we're not seeing the the share come up yet. I okay. think you need to. I think you need to select which screen it is and then click share. Like when you no, initially I did share, that. I, I did that. Just frozen. Frozen. We're just frozen today. There it goes. It's slow. Weird. Very frozen. <laughs> I'm gonna stop share for seconds. I know, I know. We were like, there we go. Out, and now everything's frozen. It's not, not That's a good look. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay. So, um, you know, for those who don't know, at HP, we, we have, we've been in the XR business making VR and AR, VR headsets uh, for about four or five years. We've, we've, we've had already four different headsets, two are in the market today, the HP Reverb G2 and the HP Reverb G2 OmniCept edition. Uh, it's a, they're both headsets built in collaboration with Microsoft Valve and then Toby is involved in the HP Reverb G2 OmniCept edition. They're super high, high resolution headsets and um, great audio and the, the OmniCept edition actually takes the display and makes it two ways. We call it like the most intelligent headset because it takes biometric feedback from eye tracking, pupillometry, face tracking, and more. Um, and so, you know, but, so but across HP, there are lots of different teams and lots of different groups coming together to look at, you know, what, what does the metaverse mean for our future? What does the metaverse mean generally? You know, we have our gaming team, we have our edge team, we have our data science team, you know, all, like if you click off all the different groups that Gabriel was mentioning earlier, you know, we probably have a different, a different group at HP focused on that and working on that. We have a collaboration, a collaboration team that's thinking about the future of work, the future of meetings. And so, um, you know, so our perspective really, really comes from that. Um, you know, HP was, has no, is, is known as the first Silicon Valley company. We've, we've been, you know, at the forefront of all of these different waves of computing. And so that's why HP jumped into XR and that's why HP is, you know, continuing to see how do, how do we build and grow in these next waves. So some of what, you know, so I, I like to always bring up Tony, Tony's rules. I know Tony himself is coming later. So we'll let Tony do the wonders on, on his rules. He's not gonna be able to make it. He's ill today. So we're just gonna leave him up. Uh, just go oh. ahead and leave him up for a second because oh. uh, yeah, Tony had to- uh, uh, Does Tony have COVID? Uh, I don't think so, but something. Oh no, <laughs> all right, I'll have to- He says he doesn't think so. All right. Well, okay. So, you know, the, you know, I would say that, you know, on, on a personal basis and, you know, from the company we're, we're pretty aligned with this, you know, when, when I look at, if you, you know, take a look at like some of the things that we've done, we've been very focused on partnerships, collaboration, um, op, you know, open XR, building on top of privacy, building, you know, building uh, data security and privacy into the core of what we are about and what we're doing. And, and you know, sort of the anti-walled gardens is, is our overall approach. And so all of that is very aligned with, with these, these seven, seven rules, um, which is there's, no, there's only one metaverse, metaverse for everyone. Nobody controls the metaverse. The metaverse is open, it's hardware independent. Um, you know, of course, we love when people use our hardware, but we like, you know, as I said, we also have a variety of other platforms where you can, you can use our hardware or somebody else's hardware and, you know, more to come in, in that front in the, in the future. Um, the metaverse is a network and then my thing is blocking the last one, but I'm sure you all can see it. Um, okay, so so that's kind of, you know, we have, we have similar point of view. Our, I would say our, our, our sort of broad broad branching point of view is it's a new economy based on digital experiences from end to end. And so, you know, that's, that's what we're focused on um, across, uh, across various parts of the company. And, and, you know, we look at, um, we look at it as that there, there's different layers and there, you know, in, in each of these layers, you know, in that end to end experience, there is, you know, there are, there, you know, what there, what, what the sort of the tech, the tech stack that will be built. There is the activity that is happening, and then there are those experiences that you know, people, as consumers or as as users will have. 
Um, and so this is, you know, quickly just going, going over that, you know, people will be exploring and creating and socializing, obviously purchasing goods and services. There'll be places to go, things to do, and then people want to develop, operate, and access new worlds. And so each of those has a different tech stack that, you know, we're looking at, um, along with many other companies, of course, on what, uh, on what they, you know, what, what, what does that mean for us? And what does that mean for our strategy and our, and our future? Um, so just jump, jump through this. And then, you know, uh, we, we look at online games, of course. Um, you know, we have a big gaming company. And then on, on a personal basis, I'll just talk about a couple of different projects that I've been involved with that I think also help us think about and define um, what, you know, these, these, early, these early steps. So for um, those who don't know, um, there's a project called Brianna's Garden that was built by Lady Phoenix and Sutu in collaboration with, with um, Brianna Taylor's family all about honoring her life. Um, and in this project, uh, it, it's premiered at Tribeca. It also went to Art Basel. And um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna keep on. And we worked really closely with Microsoft and MetaStage and Unity and a number of other uh, XR safety initiative was 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 a partner um, to help moderate to moderate. And um, we're gonna get, you'll you'll see more from this project in the future. Um, there's some really interesting questions that this project brought up around you know, I, around the essence of a, of a person around, you know, con, con staying connected with somebody. I mean, one of the most interesting quotes that Brianna's sister said about this project is that for her, she felt like the, the garden, which is an AR experience that you can download, gave her a place to go and be with her sister again, you know? And so, you know, when you think about, oh. yeah, right? It's, it's powerful. Like, it's really powerful. You know, like we know people like Prince, or others would have said like, they don't want this built for themselves. But you know, when you think about every project you do, you know, there's a large audience for it, but at the same time, there's like that very core and special audience. And this whole project was really built for Brianna's family, you know, to give their, their family a gift and to have them say something like, we feel like we can go and be with Brianna again in this augmented reality world is just like so powerful and so beautiful and, helps my thought process on like what, what is possible with these worlds we're building. Um, and then the, la the last one I'm gonna share is just about finding Pandora X, you know, a, a, a virtual, a live interactive virtual theater with Broadway actors built by Double Eye Studios um, and, that I was an executive producer on, on this project as well. Um, and, and here, you know, we were all, this, this, this came to the world at Venice and, and then South by when, when, when we were, when Broadway was closed, no one was able to go out and be entertained. And it gave, you know, and, and, and audiences around the world and, and actors around the world were really able to do like all the world's a stage, wherever they were, put on their, their Reverb G2, jump into VR chat, and they, they had the ability to stay connected, stay working, stay, and, and you know, continue that that virtual world and that feeling at, you know, wherever you were around the world that you had the experience of going to a Broadway play. So hats off to Kira Benzing and my team for creating that. So soup, that was super fast. Just, you know, some of the, like some of the early work on what we're thinking of HP, you know, continuing, continuing our values and continuing, you know, our sort of place where in the industry, what we think is important. And then two of the uh, personal projects that I worked on, on the con supporting content creators and as an executive producer and that, the, that all, really drive to like, what is identity in a virtual world? What is the future, you know, what is the future of connection? And, and you know, what is, what, what is the place for entertainment as well? On, on How do we come uh, together and celebrate each other? How do we come exactly. together and honor exactly. and, and real care? Like that's the, the human metaverse. I think Julie was also speaking about earlier and, and bringing sure that we are at first humans before we decide to engage exactly. in all of this. And I was so excited on. to come and listen and hear everyone, but I have to hop to another call up. Let's see if I can come back in later and, yeah. and hopefully the other ones. Thank you for the invite. Great Start, to see you, Joanna. We'll be sure to get you in the recording as well. Thanks all. And I'll leave, I'll drop my email and, and information if anyone wants to stay. Oh, it's so great to have you all here. And Joanna has been such an ally over the years. If you haven't had a chance to reach out to her, please do. <clears throat> and uh, we are going to welcome our next speaker here. Uh, I, I know AI Austin is a slightly different character, but it is great to see Austin here as well. Uh, Austin, could you... Uh, I, I, I don't know how to properly introduce you. So can you tell us a little bit about what you do in the world? 
Uh, yep, let me just use the first slide because I'll put a few items on that. I'm going to screen Excellent. share now, if that's okay. Please do. How's that? Have we got a screen share for you guys? You're right there. And Thank you so I'll much. I'll bring that up full screen. Does that work? Yes. So we okay. are looking at a specific approach to meta traversal that includes your your backpack or your suitcase, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, we were talking, uh, in a, in one of these sessions about a week or two weeks ago, weren't we, Evo? And uh, you suggested I just try to package it up a little bit with a with a slide or two, uh, because it's a very simple concept, actually. And that's all my intention is today, to try to define an overall conceptual approach that I think works very well. Uh, all of us are involved in many different virtual worlds and, and different social media uh, styles of thing. I think carrying some sort of continuity across them is important. And um, over the over the years, working with OpenSim and its suitcase ideas that Krista Lopez over at University of California Irvine did, uh, these things work reasonably well. There's no real standard behind it yet. So I just want to toss in a few ideas, There's a couple of slides to do that. But uh, as Evo said, background, I'm really an AI person. Um, I work on planning systems, especially in a mixed initiative context, where you've got humans, systems, robots working together cooperatively. So a lot of that is about sharing information in a common way between very different systems with very different conceptual levels of approach. And that's involved me over the years in uh, standards to do with the semantic web and ontologies, and especially in workflow and process interchange, because I tend to be interested in tasks that people do together when they share these worlds. But also when you're in multiple environments and you want to place assets or intelligent agents in those worlds to act on your behalf while your focus is elsewhere. And whether that focus is literally a travel focus or whether you're simply um, uh, needing to not pay attention to certain areas, um, but you want to be advised when things are happening. So it lends itself to all sorts of AI systems in the coming decades and centuries indeed. Um, but the simple idea today that I want to present, I've got a couple of slides for it, uh, is this idea of a travel outfit and a travel pack. It's it's not sophisticated. It's simply intended to act as an underpinning overall conceptual model within which standards can be developed and which can emerge where those standards can be really changed and technologies can emerge and things we've never envisaged can still fit within an overall framework that's kind of human understandable. Um, so the little notes at the top there, the slides are available afterwards if anybody's interested. I'll post the URL for that in a minute. But it's to give this overall approach, it's to encourage a range of services, both open source and commercial services, to start to fit into this idea and where radically different technologies can, can be used and interactive modalities, uh, modalities explored. So simple idea. Allow for a travel with travel with a common identity, which a lot of us have been discussing in the in this uh, in the metaverse traversal group and elsewhere in the OMI, with a suitable appearance by this idea of a travel outfit. A travel outfit might be tailored to the environment you're going to go in, and you carry some sort of travel pack which can package things up. Now, importantly, though, you can filter that. And it, my aim would be to filter it intelligently, but it could be very simply done as well. It could be filtered as you go out of the test it of the place where you store this stuff or keep it or it's originated so it can be filtered there according to permissions and technologies then it can be adapted or permission based moved across that may even even involve in some circumstances converters and those converters might not be instant but then you can also have the destination filtering what come in so people can place all sorts of commercial and uh, ownership and other constraints in there so final slide, um, these are ideas. These are just, so the first slide is more, more important because it's a conceptual overview I'm trying to present. But you can imagine this as a framework for all sorts of things that can be fitted into it. You, the initial outfit for the trip, the other outfits that you would like when you get there, uh, assuming that you've got some sort of different modalities you're going into. Maybe you're arriving, you're discussing things with people, but then you're going to go on and have an evening uh, dance party or something together. You probably want to take a little bit of your outfit with you. Or and a fallback avatar that may be an extremely simplistic avatar initially, but might become the basis for a genuine shared movement of assets across, as opposed to descriptions of what you'd like. We can also carry travel ID and credentials, your wallet, your crypto uh, uh, funds, and so on. It could 
involve other objects which you intend to give away when you arrive at the destination and perhaps space to be able to pick up souvenirs and gifts and uh, paid commercial items while you're there and be able to bring them back. Now, I'm not saying you can bring them back in a way that you can use in the in the home environment. It's simply a way of being able to store these things. Uh, it, obviously, that would fit with wallets and cryptos. But my interests are off, often in this area of, of, of indicating the presence you've got across multiple synchronous and asynchronous um, tasks and, and areas you're in. So this idea of it acting as a, almost like a radio pack, a communications hub to link up to those presence indicators and the uh, handles for communication back to where you were and on to the others. You can imagine it containing a cache of convert converted uh, models. You can imagine add-on packs and pockets that um, are related to specific uh, abilities to travel. And those can be provided by people in a ready-to-go form. So you might have a pack that, that relates to a destination that you can carry. So that when you get there, you can equip yourself where you couldn't equip yourself in your home environment. Pack protocol will definitely allow for these export checks, source and location platform conversion requirements, entry checks, and so on. Um, and the idea might even be that you'd have web services which could do checks on your packs pre-travel. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank that you so much, Austin. So fantastic. Thank you so much for giving us great food for thought. And I hope that that spurs a lot of you to take these ideas to your own uh, R&D. Austin, feel free to drop uh, your contact info in the chat so that people can reach out to you if they'd like to collaborate. And you I, and I know each other through- I, I will, and I've, uh, the, the slides are actually in the, in the directory on, my, on our website. So I'll post that right now in chat. Thank you. And-, and Dave Whalen, if you could please turn your camera on so I can spotlight you, you're up next, thanks. But thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Austin. All right. And Ben is going to be bringing into our next speaker. Uh, thank you. It's great to see you, David. It's been a long time, and I think I've only met you as your avatar. So it's really great to see you here. Yeah, I know. It's good to see you. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. OK, cool. My avatar is actually a lot skinnier than I am. Um, this is the COVID. Um, the, one of the effects of COVID when you're sitting literally 10 feet away from your fridge and you keep eating. I don't have a presentation, but just to give you a bit of background about what I do. So I'm the CEO of the Engage platform. Um, we've been around quite a while. Um, I think our first release was about five years ago and we're extensively used for um, education and enterprise use cases. So there's lots of events that happen inside Engage. Um, we actually only announced a couple of days ago on Fox News that there's a new virtual schools um, starting up in Florida, where all the kids are going to be getting all their lessons provided through virtual reality. This is um, in the state of Florida. And it's actually been supported by um, Jeb Bush and uh, his team. So there's a lot of really interesting things happening um, around our platform. So we're growing quite extensively. Um, you know, I think this year as well, we've, um, we've, we've obviously grown um, our revenue, but we've grown our um, client base as well. So one of the clients that is using us and how we see um, the metaverse is um, one of the clients is 3M. So the metaverse is very similar to when the internet came along in the late 90s. You know, so we have lots of companies, they're all hearing, let's say if you go back to the late 90s, or, you know, all these companies are hearing about the internet. We need to get on the internet. We need some kind of presence. That's where all the companies are today and all the companies coming to us are going, hey, we're hearing about this metaverse, you know, what can you guys do? You know, so we're listening to our customers. What they're actually wanting, and if you listen to the customers, is they want their own meta world. We call these meta worlds. So they want their own branded location. They want to have their employees inside, you know, having conversations, you know, speaking to each other. They want meeting rooms to have private meetings, you know, they want onboarding experiences. So this is on the enterprise side of things. And that's what we offer on Engage. So Engage really is a tool set for these businesses to build their own meta worlds. And um, it's been quite successful, especially this year. And even in the schools with these meta schools, and we have we have um, resellers on the platform like Victory XR as an example. I know they're setting up uh, 10 meta schools. And um, this year with Facebook as well, where these kids can actually get education through the platform, which is originally what it was designed for. But one of the big announcements that we had um, in the middle of this year was that we're releasing our own 
metaverse environment called well codenamed engage oasis it's not going to be called oasis like that's obviously a term from ready player one and uh, we don't want to get sued by by anybody you know in any kind of uh, film studio it's going to be called something else and we already have the name we haven't announced it yet but the idea um, and the offering that we provide our businesses is okay here's a ready-made package you know for x amount of money you get five persistent locations, uh, a certain amount of uh, user accounts, and you have access to all these, um, you know, cool features, and you can create your onboarding content, right? So that's an easy way for a company to step in or dip their toe in the metaverse, because when you go to a company, you know, and you say, hey, we have this amazing platform, you can create content, you have spatial recordings, spatial video, spatial audio, they really don't understand what you're saying. So you really have to show them this is a use case that we think will be useful for your business because a lot of businesses are all going remote, you know, and it's not just because of COVID. That COVID has really accelerated everything where a lot of businesses had to go fully remote. But even um, when COVID is gone, that a lot of these companies are going to stay remote in the future. And they have a real issue with keeping their employees, you know, keeping them happy, keeping them engaged. You know, a lot of employees will join a business. They never actually go to a physical building. They feel like a, a number, you know, they just feel isolated working on a computer all day. And um, anytime an email comes in, they feel like they have to answer it. You know, they never get that water cooler conversation, but that's something that can happen in a spatial platform. But with our version of the metaverse, our Engage Oasis, we really subscribe to each business can build their own world and control their own world. You know, so if you own a meta world on Engage, you can set whether um, free users can actually come in. You can set whether they have VIPE, um, you know, VIPE services. You can set what they can do inside and you can moderate your own meta world and tailor it for whatever your need. And you don't need to share it to the wider, wider world either. You can share it just internally in your own organization. But if you do want to share it to the wider world, you can share it on um, Engage Oasis, again, code name, where there's a portal to your meta world. So people can explore the Engage Oasis they can walk through a portal and it will bring them to a unique meta world. Either, you know, it could be HTC or 3M as an example, who, who have built um, a meta world um, with us. But we do uh -huh. um, we do 100% subscribe into uh, traversal between platforms. And we have that on the, the Oculus Quest where we have a Ready Player Golf, which happens on a bi-monthly basis run by um, Richard Ward at McKinsey. And he has like, uh, you know, some really top CEOs and CTOs coming into the platform and when they come into our platform they're in um, a clubhouse and they're all communicating and socializing and then when they want to play around the golf they walk through a portal it actually brings them straight to the golf game which is on um, the oculus quest and they can play around the golf seamlessly you know so it it, it is um, one of the um, one of the only platforms i think currently that actually has that traversal um, implementation inside we are looking at um, uh, avatars, which can be shared between platforms, but there is going to be certainly an issue where um, say, you know, there's VR chat and there's all space and um, Facebook's avatar system as well. They're really tailored for a younger audience, you know, so you could be in VR chat and you're standing next to a furry or you're standing next to um, some strange cyberpunk kind of person. That, av <laughs> yes. that avatar is not going to be 100% suitable when you're having like a, a professional conference or a TED talk inside Engage, you know, for walking through. So even to the level of the meta worlds that we're talking about for these companies, they can actually set a dress code, you know. So when you get to their meta world, if there's a dress code, it will automatically close you in a certain <laughs> you know, garment or even put their, their company yeah. logo on it. So yeah. there's lots of really cool things. But my, my main advice would be um, to people as we're, we're, you know, we're progressing and we're trying to get standards is let's listen to the customers. Now, who's paying for these services? So you get a lot of companies who raise a lot of money and they'll build a load of really super fantastic tech. And then they find out actually we're not generating any revenue at all. You know, this isn't what the customer base are actually looking for. You know, but the customers are certainly looking for customization. They're looking for traversal to their own applications, not just VR applications. You know, so you might Absolutely. be in a virtual world, but they want to get to a standard Wisc Windows desktop application, and it might be streamed <laughs> in. So it, it, yes. it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, um, time to be alive. I'll put it that way. I thank you for being super clear about your approach to interoperability and traversal and where you are now and where you're planning to go, because I think it's very challenging for us to sort of uh, try and guess when it comes to 100 different platforms, who's on board and who's more reticent. And I really appreciate that you have been uh, 
both available and relatively straightforward. Uh, I have found your platform to be fantastic for education and for meetings. So I can expand on that and I can see how use cases would work well in what you're yeah. describing. So thank you. Thank you for helping uh, us contextualize the, where do you need the, the next stage of R&D? I think we're going to explore. And we're gonna also look at some of those uh, use cases like Ready Player Golf in a little bit. So David, I hope you'll stick around and uh, maybe uh, chat with us as well in the chat because we're gonna, we're gonna open this up to a couple of uh, demos and, and show a little bit of what you just described. Yeah, and, and thanks so much. And we're also gonna run up against uh, Archer's time. So thank you so much, Dave. Uh, Archer, if you can hear us, uh, you're up. Uh, I have you on screen. Uh, and uh, yeah, I can hear. Do you hear me? Excellent. Take it away. Fantastic. All right. Wait, where is my camera? Okay, here is my camera and here is my car. Hi. Hello, everybody. Is it a real Archer one of these days or is it always going to be your avatar? No, the uh, real art is <laughs> long way gone. All right. Um, and happy to see uh, lots of people, lots of you I know, and uh, many of those who I don't know. Hi, I'm Archer. I'm founder and CEO of Somnium Space, and uh, I am inside Somnium Space. And um, yeah, and thanks, David, for uh, for uh, for your presentation. Um, I just want to show you, you, you talked about the worlds and the portals. So Many of you know what Somnium is and where, you know, what do we do? We are uh, where we call ourselves a highly immersive virtual reality platform on top of which people build um, lots of experiences. So, uh, you know, we are a metaverse, but big but is that the metaverse is so uh, misused word right now in the world that I'm actually uh, getting, you know, uh, uh, getting tired of using it because uh, lots of people talk about metaverse, but not so many people actually uh, understand really what the metaverse is and what kind of the impact uh, it will have. So, um, yeah, so we are a virtual reality platform where all the economy and the ownership of um, digital items um, is based on the blockchain. Um, again, lots of people here, lots of NFT stocks and all of this, uh, uh, you know, hype, which I'm not a fan of. Um, Let's put the hype aside and let's actually explore why um, NFTs matter and what, what, what the blockchain will bring to, to VR spaces and to the metaverse and why the conversions of VR and spatial, let's say spatial uh, platforms um, together with, with the blockchain, why, uh, why it will revolutionize everything as we know it. So as I said, all the ownership of all the items in Sony space is based on the blockchain. Uh, we actually have expanded, so we started as the Ethereum-based blockchain world, um, and now we are supporting Solana. So we're expanding our, um, our our capabilities, and and we believe that you know the future of the metaverse is multi-chain. So people should be able to use a Solana-based avatar with the Ethereum-based car um, in one one you know persistent instance, and that should be that should be a norm, and that's actually what's happening in, in Somnium. So this portal for so this car is also an NFT. Every NFT. Uh, this is just a sidestep. Every NFT has to have a use case. If there is an NFT without use case, forget about that NFT. If you don't have a use case for the NFTs, it's just a hype thing. You, 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 you're you speculating on the price rise and drop and whatever. Uh, but if you have a use case, like this avatar for me, this is my identity. This is my digital identity and many people know me. I did my TED talk in this avatar and many people know me from the interviews I do, from the talks I do, also inside the world, of course. And you know, for me, it doesn't matter where the price is. It has tremendous value just because I use it every day. The same with this car. You know, I use this car to drive around the world here to, to come to the meetings uh, faster and to just, you know, enjoy the racing. Um, so it has a use case and that's an amazing part. Apart from that being a collector item and it's done by a great, um, you know, crypto artist. Um, but apart from that, this is, you know, an amazing item. And one more thing uh, behind me, since we're already here on this parcel, is this, this portal... Um, this is also an NFT and this is the world. This is so-called Somnium world where people can upload any type of content through our SDK directly into that, uh, into that world and other users can just go in and access it. Um, and they can just dive in. So we call this world where I am right now a base reality world and they can dive into the user generated content um, and do whatever they want. I mean, it, it's depend depending on the user. If it's a company, they build some uh, some commercial use cases. If it's a, if it's a user, it could be a game. We have a horror game, uh, you know, out there which I, I love and hate at the same time. I just don't like horror games in VR because they're so vivid. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a user generated content. And what's what's beautiful is that people can actually monetize things. You know, um, 
because nowadays there's lots of content and lots of people, you know, on other platforms, they create a lot of content, but they don't get anything for that. They don't, uh, they, 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 they spend hours and hours and weeks to, you know, crafting things, but they are not rewarded. Um, and many of the times they are actually being, you know, the, 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 the work that which they're doing is being stolen or ripped or used by someone else without the content. And the creator um, cannot do anything with, the, with with that. So we actually, with the blockchain and with what we, how we approach this, um, this, these systems, we solve that. For example, last year, and we're very, very proud about that. Last year, avatar creators in Somnium space who create avatars and then tokenize them through our platform, they have earned more than half a million dollars net profit for them for those creators by selling avatars on top of our platform. It's amazing. We are celebrating this because this is. You know, these are money which are going to those creators and allowing them to create more and unleash their creati creativity, you know, and, and, and start making more, um, more experiences um, on top of our platform and just, you know, um, uh, kind of grow their, their, their presence. Um, and it's, of course, it's all done securely. You can see, you know, who's the creator, how it was minted. It's all on the blockchain. It's all decentralized. Um, and, you know, um, this is the beauty of the, of the digital economy. So right now, let me actually quickly jump to uh, the main plaza. Uh, yeah, just could you talk to me about what you just did? Because I, I want to understand traversal specifically with right. Somnium. So, yeah. So um, we actually were the first <clears throat> VR company together with High Fidelity who has showcased the interoperability in terms of the travel. Long way back in 2018, when we, you know, when we were um, together in, uh, in, in High Fidelity was up and running, um, and we were in a virtual reality blockchain alliance with uh, Philip Rosdale and, and Insomnium Space, um, we experimented and we created a teleportation system. Actually, the video is still existing on the, uh, on the, on the YouTube. I think Chris Madsen recorded it. Um, if I'm not mistaken, he's working on Engage right now. Uh, so he visited Somnium and what he did is he went to this teleportation hub um, and he basically clicked on the high fidelity. Right now I'm, I'm looking at the map of Somnium, but he clicked on the high fidelity um, uh, button and it within 10 seconds, it took him from Somnium to high fidelity seamlessly. So he disappeared from Somnium and he appeared in high fidelity. So we kind of proved that this is possible. But the, the challenge, of course, is that because those two companies, like us and High Fidelity, we had to um, agree on a yes. set of things to make that happen. But in the future, it will be possible without agreeing, um, even though it's a question how long of the future is that. But even if several companies, several major companies uh, will come in and, and agree on something like that, it's totally doable. It's absolutely possible yes. um, and it's amazing. But this is just one thing. What blockchain brings into the equation is, oh, let me teleport to one location. I wanna, I wanna show you something. But um, what, 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 really, um, what really matters is that um, uh, blockchain brings this, the, the basis layer for interoperability, right? It helps, it doesn't solve all the problems. And again, blockchain and NFTs are not magic. They're a really great set of tools to program things on top of, um, and they will be the underlying layer of many, many, many innovations which will be coming, um, you know, live and already live. For example, um, uh, as as our platform, uh, on top of that, but they are not a, a a holy grail of everything. So people have to realize, you know, that there is too much. There's too much financial hype around it, which is bad. There's too <laughs> much. Uh, there's too much over promises, which is bad. But the technology itself is revolutionary and it's amazing, and it will stay here for a long time. There will be cycles, there will be winters and stuff, but the, the technology will stay here. So because of the, the blockchain, we can work already. It, it brings the set of standards, which is which is um, engraved um, into this, you know, the centralized ledger, the database. Um, yes. and, we, and, we, and we can use that to leverage that and make the systems work on top and talk to each other in a much better and seamless way. I, um, I would love to dive deeper into multi-chain and I think we're yep. going to have to take it to the chat because there are some absolute uh, 
interesting conversations and questions that are coming up around I'm pretty adversarial sure. interoperability and Web3 I, I, and pre- blockchain. I'm, I'm, so, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, let's let's take that to the chat because there are fantastic conversations and questions there. And I would love to see that conversation continue. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming today, Arthur. Yes. We really, it was great it's having you. It's my pleasure. You, um, you can contact me. Of, you know, I, I'll have to leave soon, but I'll leave my contact details in the chat. Um, again, I'm very open to talk about any sorts of interoperability we are, you know, I believe that there is not one metaverse. There will be many companies, many worlds, and they will be, you know, they will be existing together. I think the, we're slightly or we're f- quickly going, tra- f- transitioning from the world where several big corporations uh, kind of own and control um, a lot of data to a world where many, many different layers of different companies will create the metaverse together and there will be, you know, m- m- big, bigger and smaller worlds um, existing together. That's what blockchain will, uh, will, will allow to, to, to create and it will kind of liberate many, many companies and many individuals um, to become uh, independent from, uh, from, from the bigger, bigger centralized platforms. So yeah, thank you very much for, for having me. It was uh, thank a big you, pleasure. Arthur. Thank you for joining us. And thank you. Uh, I believe we have Christopher Lafayette joining us from Gatherverse next. And Christopher, it's so glad to have you here. I have been just so deeply impressed with the work that you've put together, um, bringing a more human metaverse forward and, uh, and also for Gatherverse and for bringing people together in a different way. So thank you for joining us and sharing your work. Thank you for having me, Evo. And it's certainly a pleasure to be with everyone and tip of the hat to all our previous speakers. I'll be as brief as I need to be uh, as to be mindful of the time that's going on. I will share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see it. Uh, please confirm, Eva or Ben, are you able to see it? Yeah, we, we right, can see cool. it. Sweet. So one of the things that I want to talk about is obviously from a human center perspective, and I kind of want to take it in this direction and we'll just pop up a few things here. So one of the things that I've been looking at is in respects to Metatraversal is the natural steps of progression. And when we start to think about the metaverse in a very extremely quick Canva made root form is the first being idea Then we need to hardware and the software has gone and certainly it's come after hardware of the discussion. And then the natural next step is humanity. Well, why do I say that? Well, for a number of reasons. So when we start to talk about ingress, egress, and to look at where we are when it comes to um, uh, meta traversal, the things that come to mind aren't necessarily of a hardware or software operation, but more of a humanity operation. And so one of the things that I've looked at early on is coming, starting with humanity first, um, with the subsets being humaneness and benevolence. So let's, we, we know we talk about interoperations and interoperability and going from one place to the other in transmetropolitan, but I'd like to speak to why do we want to do that and for what reason? Uh, as we know, you know, we're seeing a great prolific rise in virtual worlds, and many are nascent, which they haven't been fully populated yet. Why? Because there needs to be an aggressive culture in order for people to want to populate these worlds. But first, we have to build these virtual worlds. We have to install what could be done in these virtual worlds, and then naturally comes in humanity, where I see we are taking the next step. So the steps to the metaverse and in the metaverse as to give the reason as to why we want to interoperate in the first place. So accessibility is our ingress. So people have to have access. We can't interoperate in anything if we don't have people that simply have a way to even come to the metaverse. That's one. Two is once the arrival happens, the next step when they enter into the metaverse itself is natural education. They are going to be learning about an extended reality and learning about an environment more than what it is that they see before themselves uh, in the physical existence, if you will. And then the next, once they enter into these environments, take a consideration of co- equality. Nobody certainly wants to be where they don't feel like they belong. So we've talked about diversity of avatars. We talked about um, identification of different communities. And that leads us into communities, which is tri- tribal identification and in, in, in animate and animate. So that's animate, meaning avatars, lively people that are operating within these vessels, if you will. And then an animate is the cultural settings. What is the environment? Is there environmental fidelity that leads to perceptual uh, science and perceptual fidelity that goes into cognitive fidelity? Is this an environment that I can actually relate with? Because if we're going to extend reality, then we must bring reality with it. Next, beyond that, and what's necessary is wellness. So when we're dealing with wellness, there has to be a way for me to feel secure and to feel safe within this environment. 
that I've ingressed myself into when it comes to the metaverse itself. And then the subset of wellness will actually be safety and privacy. And on the last um, in this VIN, if you will, is the safety and privacy. And then that brings us into an environment. So one of the things that we're starting to see with the success is for years and years, which is necessary, we've been going and attending enterprise conferences, which is relevant, hardware conferences, which is relevant, software conferences, which is relevant. But when I launched Gatherverse uh, that Eva graciously made mention of, we're seeing numbers that I certainly, this is my first summit, it's inaugural, but we literally have now extended it to four days because we have so much attendance in, in speakers and speakers and we just had to onboard a lot of people just to go through applications. We have thousands and thousands of people and we really haven't even began our marketing progress in which several of you are gonna be part of this event, which we're happy to have. And so when I start to think of the success that we're seeing of, and, and all the information that I'm getting from not just the speakers, from the attendees, many of the attendees aren't people in our industry. We got C-suite coming in from Universal uh, Pictures, Paramount, and vice president of Paramount. And yes, we have C-suite from Apple, Microsoft, Pico, you name it, they're there. If you know them, you, they're there. Fortune 50, Fortune 500 companies that are coming here to take a look and to understand the humanity play when we start to look at what's happening with Gatherverse. So this doesn't mean to promote Gatherverse. I can care less to do that in this setting and in this venue. But what it is to say is there's something that has to be taken into consideration that all of a sudden with this great prolific rise in the metaverse itself and the understanding of it, in which 99% of the world still does not understand what it is, C-suite on down to the common layman, woman, and man. Right now, I believe the next step in the discussion that we should have is the approach when it comes to interoperation and activity in the hyper-realistic immersive simulated environments is a humanity first approach. That's what I got. Thank you so much. Thank you for speaking directly to the humanity first approach. And I hope people will join you at Gatherverse. I'll be there. Many of us can hopefully have a deeper conversation as a part of that experience, because there are many uh, related issues to unpack. I think accessibility was brought up at the beginning of the hour, but certainly who is in the room and how do we engage together in ways that, that see each other effectively. Um, Christopher, thank you. Thank you so much for your leadership and for your care, especially. Thank you so um, much. I'm uh, gonna be bringing on our uh, next speaker here and hopefully everyone is, uh, I think we have, two, three speakers total with the demo at the end. Uh, so we will be here right till the top of the hour. So um, Ben is gonna be bringing oh, wait, on- So are you with us? So I'm not seeing you on the gallery here. Is your video on? Joyce Betancourt in the house. Hold on, yep, oops. There, there we there go. You go. Huh? Hey, Joyce. There we are, Joyce. And, and you Joyce are now spotlighted. is Welcome. an Thank absolutely you, fantastic collaborator. If you have not met Joyce, please take some time to get to know this amazing uh, leader. We've been collaborators since early Second Life. So I want to say we met in 2005, six. Uh, we created events together for the State Department, early mixed reality virtual worlds of efforts. Uh, you've been leading Avacon now for over 10 years, right? Yes. So yes. I, I would love for you to speak to the uh, the whole trajectory we've seen now, you know, 17, 18 years of R&D in this space. Uh, yeah, welcome. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I mean, there, so this is very interesting and it's funny, like being in this too, like I see a lot of connection points to uh, certainly some of that history, right? In what we're talking about even today. So let me share a screen. I'm just gonna... Higher screen. I think you guys see. Can you see this? Oops. You see my screen? Are you guys? I do. You're all set. Okay. Yeah, so you're it. Fantastic. Okay. Great. So, um, uh, you know, I'll just sort of start off here, and I'll actually let me pull up chat too while I'm here, so that way I can throw in a couple things. Um, so, uh, you know, I start, I'll start off with a little bit about me. I know Evo kind of brought up some of that. Um, uh, I, you know, Evo and I have like similar traversal, sort of speaking about traversing, have similar paths that keep traversing in and out. We're, we're, uh, we're certainly like, um, sort of like little virtual soul sisters in a way. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, this, I'll start off with this. So I kind of come at this as um, a visual designer. Uh, through this period of time, um, as Evo said, goes back to at least the, 
um, the virtual world work starts uh, for myself professionally in like 2005. Though of course I did a lot of stuff in MMOs and going back to even um, uh, text-based kind of uh, interconnected spaces. But um, uh, I am also a proponent too of, of Tony Parisi's uh, seven um, uh, sort of rules on the metaverse. Though of course with with, uh, with sort of jumping off points from there. So uh, this particular image too kind of speaks to that sort of immersive thing. And I think in a lot of the ways that uh, Ivo and I sort of initially were seeing this, like how do we connect these interconnected spaces um, in, in, a, in a sense that we all believe in that kind of then is some jumping off point to what we're kind of thinking about as, this meta, as the metaverse concept in general. Um, this particular thing is a, a few years back with an immersive um, uh, artist friend of uh, Evo's and I's, Patty Rangel, where she was an artist in residence at the arena stage. And we were working on this, like connecting like one virtual world with hollow presence into another virtual world. So um, that's kind of what this is. Um, that's me, that was me in the middle and my avatar to the left. So, um, so uh, another piece to this, uh, again, to that mixed reality stuff. So uh, starting off and, and, and Evo brought up the whole State Department stuff to the right of the screen, you'll sort of see a couple of screen images, one within um, uh, MetaPlace and another one in uh, Second Life of that uh, um, State Department uh, event that she was bringing up, the whole when Obama um, in 2008 was visiting Ghana for the first time, and, um, and where we uh, were connecting both the audiences between the, like, there were audiences in both of those places, the satellite feed that they were both seeing, we were connecting the chat back and forth. So that communication between places even uh, was important um, uh, to, the, to that like, kind of left piece too um, was a similar event that happened uh, when Kofi Annan's uh, a prominent uh, speech from Kofi Annan on the floor of the UN. We were live in the, uh, in the UN. This is when I was um, working with the New York City nonprofit Global Kids. We were live on the UN, in, on the UN floor grabbing the video bringing that into Wyville, Meta Place, Second Life, the Teen Second Life, uh, onto a virtual, onto just even embedded chat, chat interacting between all the places. Um, so folks could actually have one large conversation um, about kind of the, you know, uh, social civic uh, engagement of what, what, what was going on. Um, so those are kind of the, the base of sort of where I initially, sort of initially kind of come from these spaces. Um, and, uh, and that link that I gave in the slides actually has a link, a link that I gave to the slides too, if you want to see it later. Um, and they have links to the videos. So some of this, um, it's funny, both with AI Austin and then our tour talking, there's sort of some connection points here. Um, so in that traversing of worlds, both like we were talking about in those initial experimentations of like, you know, what we could do with mixed reality and, or bringing in, you know, text or data back and forth between places. Um, then, you know, some of that um, and, and our tour brought up the um, 2018 jump that he made from Somnium Space uh, to High Fidelity. Well, in, Philip's ma in Philip Rosedale's mind, he was uh, uh, initially also went to this idea of a larger interconnected metaverse um, uh, and has done several experiments. So in um, Linden Lab at that particular time, who um, were the makers of Second Life, um, actually had an interoperability team in 2008. Um, and that was kind of another kind of um, sort of hype blur circle up of, you know, virtual worlds and social media in general at that particular time. So 2008 to 2007 or 2000, probably nine ish was very bright with a lot of innovation that was happening at the time and people tried to look at it. And um, some of that interoperability uh, included, um, which sort of dovetails off of um, what uh, Austin Tate was saying uh open sourcing their viewer which also between that and some of these other experiments of people reverse engineering second life uh resulted in open simulator which i'll chat a little bit more about that um uh, an open source kind of cousin i guess of uh, second life and um and then uh and then there were these sort of interoperative experiments again of sort of teleporting from one place to another so this predates the somnium stuff though in a virtual world and not in a you know vr space at that time, uh, where folks were actually coming from Second Life and uh, working with Open Simulator and, uh, and teleporting directly into there. And um, Pedris, you know, we have just a few minutes. Do sure. you have a great sort of slide on where the state of it is now? 
Yeah, so, um, well, like I can jump ahead. I mean, you know, we, there is some of this, um, uh, that the, the technology behind Open Simulator, right? Certainly, uh, and Austin kind of got into this a bit, that um, of the, the, the suitcase idea, which, which kind of jumps from what Open Simulator uses, right? So that identity is uh, being a key place that interconnects people through the traversing of worlds, whether it's from one world to another, uh, another one platform to another platform or um, uh, independently uh, served up worlds within that platform, like Open Simulator, anybody can host their own um, virtual world based off of it. And that in that kind of core um, uh, server side of things is what's what allows for that in, in conjunction with that hypergrid protocol. So something like that hypergrid protocol, that identity is is actually tra traversing with you, um, which definitely kind of dovetails with what Austin Tate was talking about in regards to your identity, who you are, what you look like, um, regardless of where you're sort of jumping in from. Um, right. And uh, there was a recent, you know, and I linked to this too in there too, if you want to read more, uh, there was a great Fast Company article that kind of talks about some of, some of, some of the pretenses and principles of this that you know, uh, are good for the, or are good jumping off point for some of these thinking about a decentralized metaverse mm -hmm. on, on, um, on this. Um, and, you know, this kind of- Thanks so much, to Joyce. We're, we're gonna have to, uh, we're down to a few minutes and we still have uh, two more speakers and a demo to run, but uh, this was terrific. Thank sure. you so much. I need to bring on uh, Arnold Poots next, uh, who uh, will be uh, giving us an explanation. He actually got Metaversal traversal working uh, in uh, VR land going to frame. I'm just trying to. Here he is on the gallery. Arnold, you're you're up next. And thank you so much, Joyce. Great to see you. And thank you, Joyce. And thank you, Arnold. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Arnold from VR land. I'm, I'm the CTO from VR land, and we're building this for the last three years. And we really, really understand, we hopefully understand what's going on or the metaverse. So we need to we need to do this on an open way. So we, we decided to build our metaverse or a, a, um, a world in the metaverse with the web XR technology. So this is the important part for us. So we all have this in the web browser. So this is possible to run on the on the PC, on the Xbox, on the iPhone, on the any any phone, and of course on the on, on the iPad. So this was the important part for us. So because everyone has uh, has his device, mostly some uh, phones, and we need to be on on the phone to be in one of the metaverse. So we decided to to build this, and we we have some. Uh, interpolation to this uh, different worlds with the Oculus browser. And the Oculus browser, you have this option to have this open standard for travel to different rooms. Hey, this is the Arnold, since question. you're showing this slide, I'm gonna actually, I have a live demo of this in my Oculus to bring up that uh, I will bring on an extra thing. So if you could actually speak to that while I show it live, that would be great because we're, we're down to about 10 minutes uh, and okay. one of the things we want to do is show this. So I'll, I'll bring that up in a moment, but go ahead and, and keep talking for the moment while I bring that online. Okay, so we have this, this build and we have this inbuilt editor. So you can easily build this. Everyone can build this portal on the web. So you can uh, upload your asset and set your portal link or to any website, whatever you want. And if you, collect, uh, if you click this portal or you coll collide, with the physics, you automatic go to the new world. So, and this can be done now. This can be done on every, every platform. And the web is amazing. So the web, it's, you have so many opportunities and so many uh, new technologies to, 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 build, to build this. So see this big room is really, I'm excited what's possible with this web. And there are some open, open experiment, experiments from, uh, from the Chrome team and from the Oculus team to have this as a standard way to, to, 
to travel between worlds or between websites or between the metaverse. So this is an open standard they are working on. So it's really easy. Hopefully this will become their standard for this. And it's working on the Oculus browser now. The only problem is this is behind the flag. So this will come in some months, they, they are open and it will work for the uh, web apps. So you can install the web app on your Oculus. This is perfect. So you, are, you can be in the store from Oculus with your web app and it works everywhere. Uh, the, the Microsoft, Microsoft will in, include this and I hope many more like Firefox will, will add this too. So there's a small link, you can verify this. So Arnold, I, okay. I have it ready. If you could stop your screen sharing, uh, we'll, I have uh, this spotlighted. If you could come back on camera and talk through what I'm gonna demonstrate here. So okay. Arnold built this. Uh, you wanna, wanna tell us what you did here? Yeah, as you see a small word, you can buy this with the with the editor. This is the WebXR Awards room or world. You can run around, you can teleport around, you can speak together, you have uh, hand controls, you can teleport, yeah. And you can uh, jump inside uh, the next meta world. So there are many, there will be many meta worlds. So I hope it's working. Normally you should reach travel to the next. Oh, oh yeah, it's here. So we really, we believe in this. We will believe in all the open techniques, all the open standards, all the web XR APIs in the browser. This is real. This is the next step. And of course, web three. So we integrated some blockchain technologies, but a different, a little bit different than other spaces because we don't need to have our own contract. On reality, everyone can use his own contract. So we have no we have a standard. You need to be on a on an NFT standard, then you can use your contract on the world, on the metaverse. So uh, one thing that I think is important to bring up, uh, tell, tell everybody about the flag in, in Chrome flags that we needed to use to make this possible that people already have. Yeah, there's a Chrome flag. I can post this in the chat. There's this really simple. simple. You, you need to enter this on the address bar. Uh, I have this on my, my, my screen. Oh, let me find it. Bum, 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 bum. I closed the... Okay, we'll, we'll post it in the chat soon. Yeah. So we, we, we right now we are really interested in, in, in bringing this out. So this is some in the next month. So we bring this hopefully to, to other browsers, to other companies. And this is a standard. So yeah, everyone can use it. Okay, thanks for now. This is exciting. And Ben, I would love for you to uh, help bring some context to how this works in, in your world. Yeah. And try it, try it now. We try it, buy your own world, buy it your something you never see. So don't be shy, ask me some things. Come, come in the Discord chat will help us to buy it we don't know what's possible. So it's, it's there's so many artists or uh, they buy some stuff. Okay, thank you, everybody. Well, thank you so much, Arnold. And I, and I just wanted to quickly tell the story about how this came about is uh, two weeks ago, I had a meeting with Arnold, Gabe Baker from Frame and Matt Cool from Mozilla to talk about the Poly's WebXR Awards and how we want to actually use Metaversal Traversal at the Polys this year, uh, and Arnold got it working in an hour. So we've been having these meetings, uh, and Arnold just goes, "Oh, all you need to do is go into Chrome Flags and 
enable this. And of course you need the part where the developer actually puts the link in. And it turns out on the frame side uh, for the go-to menu, Gabe Baker got the round trip working by being able to put it in through the admin section. So earlier we changed which URL to made, make the round trip possible. So thank you so much, Arnold. Uh, it was just brilliant that you were able to get that working and uh, that we were able to give a live demonstration with this. And so uh, we are now in the in the home stretch of Meta Traversal 3. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, I have a video from uh, Amy Peck who recorded yesterday because she was actually with us the whole time, but she said she wouldn't be able to do it on camera because she would be in a car. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up uh, Amy's video and I want, while I'm doing that, uh, Eva, do you want to just thank everybody? Yes, uh, and, for... and and thank you for all of the rich R&D and ideas and uh, provocations that you're bringing to the table, as well as those of you who are organizing future R&D based on this. Uh, we did bump one demo. I put the link in and I hope you'll take a look at the work that uh, Kulala documented of a metaverse sort of portal jump across multiple VR and WebXR experiences experiences as well. So uh, check out that link afterward, but we're going to take a look at what Ben has been doing as far as VR traversal and, and making events much easier to move between. All right. Hi, everyone. I appreciate you letting me record because I really wanted to be part of this conversation. I think this is a very important conversation. Um, so in my short five minutes, I, I have a lot of ground to cover, so hopefully I can get through everything. I think I want to start with, with NFTs and, and this, this kind of land grab mentality. I mean, we're, we're in full hype cycle swing of the metaverse, you know, on this whole concept of the metaverse. And, you know, the metaverse did not just fall out of the sky. It, it is an evolution. It's a journey. And I think we don't need to move so quickly. What we do need to do is just be much more thoughtful about what we want from all of this. And, you know, NFTs right now to me feels like this kind of scammy money, money grab. And, you know, we're creating this false scarcity where the irony is that the metaverse is this vast landscape of abundance, right? It, it's, it's infinite. And yet we're trying to kind of lock it down. And I really think that the power of NFT is in creation and in collaborative creativity and in an origin story. So, you know, much like in music, there was sampling. And then there was this whole kind of backlash about, well, how do the original artists get paid? Well, this is a way that, you know, artists can put their creations out there and instead of a kind of planting a flag and assigning this immediate value to it they can actually put it out there in the world for others to kind of create and collaborate on top of it and each of those layers for me that you know that kind of nft is is really just marking a moment in time of where an original piece of artwork or music or any kind of creation inspires a next evolution and generation. And so that's one piece of it. The other piece that I think is really important is, I think all of us have a slightly different version of what the metaverse actually is. I think we have sometimes two and three different versions and, and certainly there are digital realms, but I really even extend the metaverse into, you know, the AR cloud and look at it as layers of data. And I think that's very important to the conversation we're having today about this interoperability and this, you know, ability to kind of move between worlds seamlessly in the same way that, you know, kind of via the AR cloud, uh, you know, and spatial anchoring, we're going to be able to just seamlessly access any particular layer of data uh, you know, that, that has context, right? Or, you know, spatial context that has relevance to our lives at that particular moment. So I think if we look at that, that type of experience, it's, it's not so much, you know, what the experience is, or even if we're moving between worlds, whether it's in an elevator or a race car, I've seen some great ideas but it's the how, it's kind of the technical capability and, and the standards. And 
you know, we as consumers, you know, it's, I, I've read so much where it's like, we're, you know, hoping that regulators are going to hop in and, and help us with standards. But this is really a, sort of the moment of the individual. And, and, it's, and it's really what our, our role is uh, in terms of our self-sovereign identity in this metaverse is we as consumers have to demand not only the standards be built to kind of protect us, but also to allow us to expand the experience. Again, look at this as an abundant experience as opposed to one of scarcity. And, and really one of kind of, you know, imagination and, and on the self-sovereign identity piece, you know, I believe that our avatars will be our digital representatives in, in both the physical and, and digital landscape and we'll be able to move kind of seamlessly from experience to experience. And we'll have our public persona, much like all of the information that we share on social media and that will be accessible. Um, then if, we're, if we really build the right interface, we will be able to then control our private data. And in fact, potentially even monetize it. And we can look at different data points that can help inform what value is in the future and, and especially in the digital landscape. And so for example, now we just have you know, a, a thing that has a price, right? But we can actually, it doesn't have to be around a pure money exchange or a, poor, a, a pure crypto exchange. There can be other factors into why I might sell you something, right? Your value system might be similar to mine. With is, you know, get involved, roll up your sleeves. Let's let's actually look at this as a collective and and not try and build siloed worlds, um, but but really look at from the infrastructure perspective what needs to happen. And I'm going to leave that to the hardcore network engineers and and technologists. Um, but let's look at, at you know the human perspective and what's important to us in the future and how we're going to actually build this and what we want from it. Um, but but I believe that this notion of scarcity and and this money grab is not the way to go. We really need to be smart. We can model out any type of opportunity and different value systems and different ways of living. Uh, and, and so let's utilize that instead of, you know, focusing on this immediate, uh, you know, economic benefit, because the money will come, you know, if we build it, the money will come. So I'm really, really happy that I, that I got special dispensation to report this today. I will be on the phone, but I'm going to be traveling today. I'll be listening in and I look forward to working with all of you uh, and, and, you know, let's, let's build this. Amy, she has been a fantastic uh, collaborator and a liner of work along the lines. And she's absolutely right that we're here about more than just transactions and money. We're here to make sure that people can work together effectively and do their best work. Um, I personally don't want a pay to play metaverse. I want to make sure that we have open spaces for everyone to thrive. And I know that each of you are working on aspects of how that is going to work together. So uh, this is part of a conversation that is ongoing. Some of you have asked how to stay in the conversation and to uh, stay involved. We are absolutely planning to do uh, a different format, but something in the coming weeks. Uh, it will likely be the first week of March. Uh, that will be announced later on. We are not going to necessarily put that as a time banked thing on your calendars today, but please stay in touch and we will be sure to get back to you. On You're thinking all of, of that. March 3rd, though. So just March 3rd, March yes. 3rd. If you want to yeah. box around. Uh, and we're thinking that this needs to be more deliberative, collaborative. Uh, longer session and and really you know digging in at this stage we've heard great perspectives over the last three sessions please go back and watch those videos if you haven't already and uh, I look forward to seeing some of the research and 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 the, the experiments that come out of this if you did not get the chance to see the video that I put in the chat I'll, I'll go ahead and post it one more time it's from uh, uh, Wagner James, uh, I can, uh, I can roll it as we close out the session if you want, Evo. Uh, we can we can say goodbye and and, Let's and, do that. and roll yeah. that as the credits if you want. Uh, but uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Ben and uh, Evo, before we go, and, and Julie. Go ahead, Julie. 
Julie, after yeah, we no, do that, I was going to show you what, what I learned. I was going to show everybody what we learned and I'm going to, um, okay. I think, uh, this is where, yeah, just quickly. Cause you know, this is what I got out of it. First of all, I, I took down lots of notes based on all of our speakers and stuff. We'll put these into images, uh, clean these up. And, but out of what we learned today, look, focus on the red uh, squares. Um, you know, I reviewed this at the beginning, uh, but these red squares were kind of takeaways from all of the different talks. Like, let's talk about spatial standards, uh, humanity first approach, the asset backpack, customizing to own the plat to own the platforms, multi-chain blockchain, uh, the creative collaboration, uh, layers of data management. Consumers need to demand the protection. Um, I'll get this into a PDF. We'll share this out with everybody or take a screenshot quickly, but this is some of the feedback that I got from all the presentations today. Let's move this forward together and create that next conversation on March 3rd. So thanks very much. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Julie. All right, everybody, say cheese. It's, it's time for the screenshot on one, <laughs> two, say metatraversal, yay. All right. Everybody, thank you so much. Have a happy Thursday. Thank you, Evo. Great job. Great job, mm -hmm. Julie and everybody. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, if you want to stick yeah. around and watch that little video, we will go ahead and roll it on the back and I will absolutely talk through it. So if you haven't seen this video yet, uh, it is linked over there, but this is a, a space where you can begin to uh, explore what different types of traversals might look like. Uh, obviously, there's a much bigger conversation. This is a quick demonstration of portals between worlds. So here I am in Neos, and I'm going to open a website. This is from Kulala, by the way. It's a link that's opening on my computer. But in this instance, it's an XR web page that's opening here. So when we open it, it's opening the website as XR inside of Neos. And that lets us go inside so that we can then go to a different game. So the first traversal here is an elevator. So now, the elevator one. is one UX so approach. You make an elevator uh, to anywhere. The elevator there. was uh, one way That's to approach great. how do you do the sort of server like handshake in a clean way. Uh, loading in any land, and you don't really see the loading because this is a separate application uh, running on a you know different thread, uh, different process. You know, was that a design okay. choice to keep the outside from in any land? That was to over. to manage so, that load, but you're going right. to see other elevator. types of traversals happen next. The elevator um, gets rid land. of that it's, needing to have a load screen. Oh. Yeah, it, could, it includes what's happening. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it makes like the, the, the server metaphor of the shape. elevator that you can get in with other people. Right. This right. Is, it's a social experience. You know, the kind of portal that people expect to see. We're expecting to see these open by operating systems. But this is also just a website. Oh, I'm talking on the Zoom. Because I can open it as an XR application. Oh, someone. <laughs> land. So he's in any land, and there are um, people around hello. him, by Sorry. the way. So that's uh, what's happening yeah, right now. You're seeing this recording is a right live now. recording from about two weeks Sorry. ago. So um, going into this portal uh, will then take me into this other reality. So this uh, is a live WebXR oh. website that he's walking from one to the next, so from now Anyland I'm in, to Hubs. This is the Hubs Mozilla scene. Uh, yeah, it's like for Tele School. Um, so last portal. Um, if anybody's interested in this, you should um, yeah push for the metaverse to be these open platforms like the web. We don't need an operating system. If you want to talk about it sometime. Happy to meet in Grella Tag anytime if you want to talk. So, last portal. Here we go. go. And now you're in Grella Tag. So, that is a very basic experience and of moving from VR to a WebXR experience. And again, um, that is not moving back and forth, which is what Ben has been working on and uh, what you saw a little bit earlier from Arnold. So um, thank you. Thank you for sharing all of those fantastic R&D projects. If you're interested in learning more about what they're working on, you're welcome to join us at omigroup.org uh, where some of this R&D has been taking place. Thank you, Evo. Thank you for your passion.
Yeah, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're going to come back and do this again in March. Uh, if you have great ideas that need to be hacked on together, uh, let's have that exploration now because there are definitely hackathons and other types of events organizing now for spring and summer. And uh, I'd love to see us be able to align our work in effective ways. Thank you all for joining us.